You're watching Facets Television. I am Kevin McDonald, and today with me is Tony Everett. Tony is the chief playmaker of an organization called The Pure Game, which is a 501c3 nonprofit here in Orange County that's doing some really wonderful things with our kids and experiential learning. So let's have a chat with Tony. Tony, thanks so much for coming Thank in. Thank you. Really glad that you could come in and talk with us today. So I'm um, having some experience with uh, experiential learning myself. Mm -hmm. I was really fascinated to hear what you have going on. So let's start with a little background on what your role is and how you started the organization, and then we can get into a little bit of the sure. minutia of how it works. Yeah. Um, well, I moved over here 15 years ago from England, mm -hmm. and um, I've had a background with soccer all my life. But the soccer that I played back in England was very uh, grassroots, just down at the park with, with friends, pick-up type soccer. Mm -hmm. and. Um, when I came out here, I started coaching AYSO and then club. And one of the things that I realized really quickly was how structured and organized it was and how that structure and organization actually takes away from the experience for kids. So I wanted to do something a little bit different. And I created this kind of street soccer format. Um, mm -hmm. And it's much more free for the kids to come and play. And within doing that, I found that I could um, going to some of the inner city areas of, of Orange County mm -hmm. and work with some of the at-risk kids to play and have some fun with the game of soccer. And then and not feel that. like they're being uh, managed. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It oh, was just a, a ball, a couple of goals, go play, have some fun, laugh. Mm -hmm. um, but then within that, you can then also take the time to build relationships, uh, develop friendships, and then teach them about life through the game. Mm -hmm. And it's nice and easy. If you knock someone over, go pick them up. That's mm -hmm. showing someone respect. Mm -hmm. So basically what it seems to me like is you're doing some socialization as part of your program, mm -hmm. clearly. Yeah. Um, what's the ultimate mission of the organization, if you were to, to cue it into a few sentences? Yeah, what, what we're really looking to do is um, develop these kids into um, citizens that provide and, and work within their communities, mm -hmm. that they understand their purpose in life, that they know where they're going, and so therefore apply themselves today at school so they can see a future for themselves when they graduate out of school. Now, in the, the, there's a program called uh, Science OC that mm -hmm. I'm an advisor for and have been for years, and they found actually that children um, have great improvement in English language, mm -hmm. believe it or not, from doing tactile touch and experiential yeah. learning in science. Are you finding that the, the language barriers improved in other parts of their lives? I mean, are you seeing things that are tangible that you that you can, you can talk about? Yeah, there's, there's actually a lot of changes through what we do. It's amazing, 20 minutes of running around during an in-school lunchtime recess program engages the brain in such a way that when they go back to their classroom, they're now engaged in the material. So mm -hmm. we're finding that as a byproduct of what we do, grades are improving, people are, kids are feeling safer in school, mm -hmm. um, we're developing this, this community within the school, so kids are, are actually attending school because they want to be there. Mm -hmm. And, and what, we'll try, what we try and do is talk about the benefits of school, not as an obligation to go to, but as a tool to progress them through into their life. And once they see it as a tool, they start to apply themselves. Sure, of course. Do you see that there's less racial balkanization as a result too? The, you know, you get that, that better integration. Absolutely. Kids? Yeah, I think one, so one of the things with uh, a standard sports program is we focus on sport. And once you focus on sport, then you're telling a kid what to do, how to do it. And kids don't like that because they're being shouted at, it's not fun anymore. And so a lot of kids will drop out of sports programs. But if you make it less about the sport and more about the individual child, mm -hmm. then it's anyone can come out and play and because we don't focus on sport uh, we've got kids who are non soccer players or even non athletes mm -hmm. if, if you will and so we've got a large audience who are playing and so it's much more of an inclusive program and because we talk about respect and compassion and cooperation throughout the, the program that we're working with them mm -hmm. they get to understand that in an experiential way and we get them to live that out so from that perspective, it sounds to me like, let's just say that you can get a benefit out of a child that's never, normally wouldn't be in sports. Mm -hmm. 
um, the the ability to connect hand and foot with brain, um, and then later on potentially in their own science programs yes. or the things because they're going to tend to be yeah. non-sports, right? Um, I think that could be a huge crossover benefit by convincing them that they don't have to be great at it. They can just participate in it. And it's, it's about putting their best foot forward in any given situation. Yeah, you might not like the game. You might not like what you're doing. You might not be great at what you're doing. But can you be the best you you can be in that given situation? Because we all come across that in life. There are times when we don't do what we like to do, but we've exactly. still got to be the very best we can be in that situation. So it sounds like you're also, because of the, the whole idea of respect, it, it, it seems to me that this would be a good place for a child to try sports without feeling like they're potentially going to get bullied by the other kids or, you know, um, otherwise discouraged from wanting to play. Absolutely. How, how many children are, are have you affected to date that you, that you can... We're up to about 12,000 kids now That's within the children. Orange County area, yeah. And so is it district-wide or is it by school? How, how is the program distributed? We're currently working through individual schools. Uh, okay. The plan is to start to approach districts and start to work with districts. Okay. Um, we found each school now has particular goals set within this LCAP plan, which is a local community accountability program. Mm -hmm. And um, we're helping schools hit those goals and objectives. And so now we can actually start to approach districts and say we can actually help all of your schools. Uh, hit those goals and objectives. That's great. Have you thought about doing any of the science around it to, to prove the um, efficacy of your program? Yes. We are working hard to try and get pre and post tests done. We're working hard to get some of that data that we need. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, we're a small organization. There's me and three field champions. And so it's really hard to kind of wow, really... Wow, yeah, yeah. We've got a couple of part-time field champions as well that, that work in, and we've got some volunteers. Um, but that's over the course of time, summer camps, uh, a lot sure. of programs that are going in there. Um, but it's hard to do it all when there's just the six of us. So what, is, there, um, is there a target for a volunteer? Do, do they have to have you know, a sociology background, or is it just people that want to care about kids? Just want to care about kids. Okay. If you care about kids, then you can get involved within the Pure Game program. And it's not about, again, I'll emphasize, it's not about the game of soccer. So mm -hmm. uh, you don't have to have sports background, soccer background. If you like kids and you like encouraging kids, come out and join us. It's a great opportunity for these kids to experience the benefits of a mentor. So it sounds like a really good um, opportunity for those, too, that want to help with social programs and mm -hmm. get kids, you know, integrated if that's their care. Yes. Um, without having to spend a whole lot of money. So what type of funding are you looking for right now? Are you looking for grant money, direct donations? I mean, what? because the audience that's watching, <laughs> yeah. you know, you, you make Well, sure there's, there's several things that we're doing in there. Yes, as a nonprofit, we look for the grant, grant writing, grant funding, foundations, individual donors, monthly sponsors, uh, corporate sponsors. But we're actually doing a, a spin-off on that now as well, and we're trying to create our own income revenue source, and we're doing it through some corporate team building programs. Uh, we found that what we do with the kids works just as well in a corporate setting, and it actually gets them to break down some of the boundaries that are set within a corporation, so we get corporations working together. Interesting. Yeah, and we can teach the corporation's character as well. It's amazing how many adults still need to I was about, about to character. say, I can see, I know a few. I'd like to, <laughs> I'd like to get them to sign up. Yeah, so. and we've got many ways of doing that. We've just uh, launched our own bubble soccer program, which mm -hmm. is playing soccer in a very large bubble. Um, it's one no of kidding. the funnest things you'll ever do, and so adults love that. Um, I think I think when we when we bring the the corporate team building program in the bubble soccer we play footy golf so we play soccer on a golf course mm -hmm. when we bring those programs to adults it gives them the chance to actually realize their youth again so they go back to being a child again and, in a and they can laugh, way yeah, too, yeah. they can laugh smile and just get on with each other it breaks down the barriers we can then talk about what does that look like in your team within the company that you're working at what role do you play where are you sitting in within that. Mm -hmm. Within that, and if area. people have to, let's say, play nice together mm -hmm. in, in a more public forum than when they're in a private forum, mm -hmm. they may also be more respectful yes. and kind. And it's interesting what happens when you have. That's why team building does work if it's the right kind. Yes. Um, and I'm fascinated to see that you found a way to 
fund the program for the children, or is there a, a funnel that goes from that program automatically? Yes, down? there is. They know that as yeah. part of it? So um, if we're working with a corporation, um, some of the money goes to cover the cost of that particular program, mm -hmm. but then a lot of the money will actually go back into and funnel back into the pure game in school, after school programming, yeah. And, and what, we're, what we're working on is sponsoring specific schools. There are schools out there that, that can't afford a program like this, and so we'll will directly look at that school and say this program from this corporation will go and help that That's school great. which is which was probably in their local community as That's well great. well maybe what we'll get uh, if we can get another chance maybe we'll come out in the field and check out uh, what you guys are doing one of these days it sounds like a lot of fun awesome. and i would enjoy um, i want to thank you for thank coming you in much. i really appreciate your sharing with us today thank you and you've been watching facets television and with us today was the ceo of the pure game and his name is tony everett he is the chief playmaker and founder of the organization. Thanks for coming in. I Thank really you. appreciate it. Thank you folks for watching. We'll see you again next time. <clears throat> My name is Hunter Scarborough, CEO and founder of Voter, and you are watching Eye on Business. Welcome to Eye on Business Innovation, where we look at innovative companies, innovative people, and their innovative products. Today, we are very fortunate to have with us Hunter Scarborough of Voter. Hunter, welcome to the show. Happy to be here, Shan. Thanks. So you've got a very interesting application that uh, is also very timely. So tell us a little bit about Voter and what it does. Right. So Voter is uh, what I often call it is Tinder for politics. So okay. essentially, you answer a handful of questions uh, based on your political beliefs, and we can show you then which candidates match your beliefs and have a track record to support that. Essentially, giving everyone a quick, uh, easy, fun way to become informed in an election. Now, what was the motivation for coming up with this? Right, so sort of the genesis was uh, I was right after graduating college, I worked in advertising for um, a couple of years. And when an election would roll around, um, I just didn't have time to do personal research. Okay. And like most people, I wasn't super trusting of um, typical media outlets, right? Okay. Okay. Um, and I, I was working 12, 14 hour days, so I just didn't have the time. And I thought, you know, it's in the 21st century, there has to be a way to take technology and leverage it to make this process easier. Yeah. Um, pretty quickly, I had the idea to kind of take online dating, the online dating model of okay. matching, and apply that to politics. Um, certainly not to f the first to do that. Okay. Uh, I thought so at the time. After some, some quick research, a Google search, uh, I realized that was not the case. But uh, my vision for it, I did realize, was actually quite different. Okay. And that's that uh, all the tools out there, for the most part, are built by politically engaged people. Okay. And whether they m mean to do this or not, when something's built by someone that's politically engaged, it's sort of built for someone that's also okay. politically engaged. Okay. And so a lot of these tools end up falling on deaf ears. And I always like to emphasize that in, in pretty much every way, I'm very much like the average millennial voter. Okay. And that's a huge advantage for us because I come from my own target audience. So I'm constantly okay. asking myself, what does this need to look like for me to want to use it? Okay. Um, and from what I've seen in the political information space, even, as, even specific to like matchmaking to candidates, okay. no one has hit the mark okay. uh, that we're looking at. So if I understand it, this is designed to help on multiple levels. So you're helping match voters to their you know, ideal candidate. Mm -hmm. But as I understand it, the end result is to get more people to vote as well. Right. Well, so ideally, uh, you know, when I'm <laughs> we're actually raising our seed financing right now. So we're doing a lot okay. of pitch, uh, pitching a lot of investors. And the first slide that I show them is the problems that we're solving. And the okay. first problem on that list is uninformed voters don't vote, or worse, do. <laughs> right? And so, so that kind of speaks to what you're saying. Like, yes, we're absolutely trying to help people get to, the, um, to their polling places. Okay. But um, more than that, we want them to actually be making a, a meaningful impact when they're there. Oh, you know, okay, gotcha. okay. Uh, not picking a candidate based on the color of their tie or, okay. or <laughs> something along those <laughs> okay. lines, right? Um, Which would be a real challenge, uh, so. <laughs> That's, I like that tie. It's nice. <laughs> so. Um, oh, yeah, with that tie, though, specifically. <laughs> you <laughs> yes, got every party represented. Exactly. That's the whole idea. So uh, I guess the, the real question here is, what's a good example of this? So if I'm watching the Republican debates and there's 12 candidates up there, um, that can be a tough choice because some are better known than others, but how would I find out what's my ideal match? Right, so perfect example, um, yeah, so the Republican primary, lots of candidates. Um, the way the app works, the reason I say Tinder for politics specifically is because it's actually a swiping 
interface. Okay. If you're familiar with Tinder at all, I don't necessarily expect you to be, but but I've um, gotten recently I, gotten a little <laughs> bit more familiar with it. <laughs> okay, so so you might be familiar with that swiping interface, yep, right? Where exactly. you swipe left or your right, or you know, for yes or no. Uh, it's really fun. It's really intuitive, okay. and uh, so we sort of mimicked that when it comes to big political issues. So let's say um, you basically answer, you know. Increase the minimum wage, yes or no. Uh, legalize okay. marijuana, yes or no. You know, pro-life, cho pro-choice, stuff like that. Yeah. Those big polarizing issues right, okay. off, right out of the gate. Um, and the deeper you go, the more nuanced those political questions get. Uh, but basically, the more of those you answer, the more accurately we can then match you to okay. different candidates. And we do it percentage-based. So your top match, you know, might be, oh, 76%, you know, candidate X. Uh, candidate Y is like, oh, you know, eight, uh, 62%. Okay, that's pretty high too, but like, you can kind of see we, di we agree on this, we disagree on this, this is, we break it down, we try to make it as, as again, as intuitive, as engaging, you know, almost gamified to an extent. So it's okay. fun, okay. but you're getting really valuable in information from it. So the real advantage, this it sounds like, though, is instead of, like you said, me just kind of watching TV and being influenced by the pundits, I actually get a match to my beliefs to the, to the candidate that would best represent my views. Is that the... That, is, uh, that sums it up pretty well in a nutshell. Okay. Um, the one thing I would add to that is that uh, we actually look at what I would call big civic data. Mm -hmm. So when I said earlier on, you know, it's the 21st century, there's got to be a way to take technology and make this process easier. Yeah. A big part of that is, is the trust you have in a candidate, right? Okay. So okay. to make sure that you can trust those results, you know, on the surface it's very fun, it's very engaging, okay. but under the hood there's a lot going on. So when I say big civic data, we look at a candidate's voting records, we look at their oh, okay. legislative record, we look at their public stances, we do speech analytics. We try to keep everything as objective as possible, and, uh, like basically numerical as possible. So okay. when I say speech analytics, uh, something like along the lines of, let's say a candidate says the word uh, immigration 30 times over the month of okay. July, and they say the word economy 10 times, okay. we can infer that immigration is of greater importance okay. because it's, okay. it's coming up a lot more in their dialogue. Gotcha. Um, so just trying to keep everything as basically as math-based as possible so there's not so much a human component um, that can influence it. Now, would this apply to major races like the presidential race? Or can it be used for local politics? I mean, what's the... Uh, so absolutely our goal is to, is to get down to the local level. Um, the, live ver the app is live in the App Store right now, and the version okay. that's, that's out there right now shows... Uh, presidential matches and party matches. Okay. I'm really excited to announce actually that uh, in the next week and a half we'll be releasing sort of what I would call Voter 2.0. Okay. Uh, and in that new version we actually have support for all the gubernatorial elections. Gubernatorial okay. is kind of a funny word, but governor elections, okay. right? Um, in 2016. And all of the Senate elections actually. Okay. Um, so we're really excited. So yeah, we're already kind of branching down more local. Okay. Eventually, we'd like to get down to local, local, because that's where the opportunity is greatest. I don't know local standards across the board, okay. but I do know that in Los Angeles, for example, where we're based, uh, local turnout regularly goes below 10%, which okay. is extremely unfortunate. <laughs> okay. So well, we'd like to have like a, a positive impact there, yeah. Sounds like you guys may be the answer for some of that. So you've been a busy guy lately. Tell us about some of the whistle stops you've had on your campaign. Mm. So let's see. Uh, actually... So I, I, I should mention I graduated from Chapman University okay. right here in, in Orange County where we are. And uh, my best friend from college is actually our PR guy, and he's been doing a bang-up job, honestly. We were uh, featured in the Washington Post, TechCrunch, Fast Company. We're actually in this month's uh, Newsweek special edition okay. um, featured as like an up-and-coming app. So uh, that was quite exciting. I will say, you know, his name is Ian. Ian has been doing a fantastic job on PR. Mm -hmm. Um, but most of it's been online, and so this month to have something that I can physically hold in my hands yep. has been really exciting. The fact that I can go into a grocery store and see a magazine on the shelf and, and flip yep. to a page and go, there we are, um, is really fun. So <laughs> Very exciting stuff, yeah. very exciting stuff. And your timing is unbelievable. I mean, um, you know, Bill Gross once did a famous talk about timing's the most important feature, and you're, you're hitting that one. Yeah, it's, it's, it seems that way now, right? Mm. But I will say I think... Well, okay. I mean, yeah, it definitely seems that way now. It's hard to argue against that. Um, I think for something like this, the timing would inevitably come along, though, right? Okay. It's certainly a problem. I would say that politics is sort of the last, one of the last bastions to hold out against technological, technological disruption, right? Yeah. Um, you know, you've had all these different industries just get totally reshaped. Yeah. And um, politics is kind of uh, not hit that point yet, yeah. and, and okay. we want to be at the forefront of that. And I think we are. <laughs> well, it's impressive having, what you've yeah. done. I mean, you're, you're taking, I mean, obviously there's always going to be a lot of emotion in politics and 
a lot of rhetoric, but the fact that you can help people find their ideal candidate and maybe encourage the, the, the voter turnout to go higher and maybe even have informed voters, wouldn't that be special, huh? Well, I really appreciate what you're doing, and I really appreciate you coming on the show. So thank you very much, Hunter. Thank you, Shan. Happy to be here. Good. You have been watching Eye on Business Innovation. Hi, this is Dan Lubeck. I am the managing director and founder of Souls Capital Partners, and you are watching Eye on Business. Hi, this is David Friedman for Street Savvy Business on Eye on Business. I uh, want to welcome uh, Dan Lubeck. Dan is the managing director and founder for Solus Capital Partners. He spent 20 years in the private equity business, and he was a lawyer, of all things, and got his degree from U.S. I have to say that because, you know, lawyers are lawyers. Absolutely. They so, say once you're a lawyer, you're always a lawyer. Uh, yeah, but now you're, now you're um, a, a, a capitalist in a sense. I, I guess am. lawyers are always capitalists. But tell me, what was the uh, genesis of Solus Capital Partners? How did oh. you start it? Oh, that's a great question. So Solus uh, is my second go-around as a private equity investor. My first was a firm called Unique Investment Corp, which uh, the true founder was kind enough to call me the co-founder of. But essentially the same philosophy. The idea is to look around for great companies. Uh, typically, smaller companies tend to 60 million revenue, typically. Yeah and then make an investment uh, partnering or majority and then partner with management and help them grow and, and create value. All right, so you talk about the philosophy. What I'm hearing is partnering. Tell me what you mean by partnering and how does that really help a company? That's a great question. Partnering, I think, in why we are good partners and it's irrespective of how much of a company we buy but philosophically, we approach this business of investing as not buying parts of companies, but betting on leaders and leadership teams. Okay. And so when you have that philosophy, which we truly do, it's, it's a fundamental part of our DNA. From that emanates a lot of things, how we structure, how we view our role once an investment is made. And in our case, because we view the world this way, we really view our role as partners. It doesn't matter how much of a company we own, whether it's majority or 50-50. We view our role as to support the leaders, bring resources to the table, be a good strategic sounding board, and really help them take the company to the next level. Now, do you do more of a turnaround, or do you just make sure they're on track? What was, give me an example, a really cool example that you're really proud of, of a company that you help be a little more than just a partner, more like a guiding light. Okay. Uh, we did a software investment uh, in our prior fund. We're now investing out of our second fund, but our prior fund, we did a software investment backing these two great guys, uh, Vince and Greg, that were buying a division of a British public company. Mm -hmm. It was a U.S.-based company. It was, a, it was a stepchild that the parent really wasn't interested in anymore. Uh, they felt there was a huge opportunity. Neither of them had really run a standalone uh, company or been responsible for a p and uh, We got to know them. We decided that the guys were a great bet. We liked what they did. We liked their idea of where to take it. We helped them spin it out from the parent. And I think there, one of the transformational moments came. We're at a board meeting. We kept searching for a, a VP of sales and, and we had an epiphany. The VP of sales was sitting at the table, which was our, C our CEO. Uh -huh. And so from that epiphany, we, we helped him figure out where he was spending time other than on developing the sales. They were, it was uh, mainly selling to militaries. So very long sales cycle, right, right. very relationship driven. And so we got him out from behind his desk. We helped him find other people uh, or other ways to get some things off his desk so he could focus on that. And it was pivotal and transformational. I think if he was the third guy at this table, he would agree. All right, so did he give up his CEO role and just become CSO, or did he maintain, have two hats? No, he kept his CEO role, uh, but recognized that within that role, it, his paramount uh, way of really helping the company evolve and to create value was to be out in the world and developing the relationships that ultimately the company would utilize to help um, um, sell their software product. 
Now, but wouldn't you believe that a CEO should really be the chief salesperson, especially in the smaller growing companies? Or does it, well, well here's the other qu real question. Does it change in the role and the philosophy you have depending on the kind of company and the size of company? Yes and yes. Okay. Uh, Which is the yes part? Yes to both. Okay. okay. So it's, it really depends on the type <laughs> of company as to what type of CEO you need. It also depends on the size of the company as to what type of CEO you need. So when we're looking at an investment, for example, we not only look at the existing team, we also ask ourselves, what is this company going to need in leadership to execute on a strategic plan? And do the leaders that are in place have the qualities that are needed? In this case, it's a very complex, it was a very complex product. Uh, it was very long sales cycle, lots of relationships, lots of bureaucratic steps, and, and it was very hard to find someone that had the technical expertise and the, the expertise okay. on the company, so it made it clear that Vince was the right guy to be leading that charge. Other companies, and often one of the most important things we do is help them build a true sales team so that we actually deleverage the founder and CEO's role in the sales. So it yeah. could be exactly opposite. Um, it just, that was one where I was thinking, you know, there was a real epiphany and it was something obvious in hindsight, but something that wasn't clear before then that made a big difference. Now, you were a CEO or at least an interim CEO for a couple of companies. Did that help you? Does it help you in your business, um, helping companies in partnership or philosophy? Yes, you know, without question. So you have credibility. You have credibility, you have appreciation. There's, you cannot, you know, I, I, I have the great pleasure of working with a couple MBAs, one from Harvard, one from Yale. Those are my two younger partners, and I think they would agree. Until you're on the front line of a bad investment, you really yeah. don't know what it means to be a good investor. Once you've done that, you really earn some stripes, and it... It helps, you know, it helps you appreciate the role and responsibility of day-to-day -day leaders of companies. And uh, it's an amazing education. You can't learn that in, in, in a school. Okay, I'm going to give you one final uh, softball for you. Okay. It's the start of the new year where companies are looking for, uh, re-looking at their strategic plan, their vision and the mission. What would you say to the leaders of companies today, the CEOs or the chairman or the COOs, to get them off on the right foot in 2016? I think a great little rule of thumb is run the company as if you're going to sell it in five years. And if you do that, it's a, it's a great uh, arbitrator for hard decisions. Yeah. You know, personnel, strategic. It doesn't mean you have to sell your company in five years. Right. But it means that if you're running it that way, you're running it to really maximize its potential. I think it's the right way to run a company. Now, there may be personal, you know, if ultimately what matters most is what's important to the stakeholders. And if the stakeholders aren't of a mindset to maximize the potential of the company, if there's personal relationships that they feel are more important than doing mm -hmm. that, then so be it. But if you want to maximize a company, if you want to, uh, realize the maximum potential that it can, then we feel run it like you're going to sell it in five years. But you keep companies for the long term, right? Sure. I mean, it, it's, I mean, ultimately our job is to create a realization. You know, our right, job right. is to create a realization in return for our investors. We do that not by extracting value. We do that by sharing in the value creation. So okay. if we don't create value, we're unsuccessful. Uh, so our, our interests are very aligned with the stakeholder of the company, and our interests are very aligned with the company's needs. Perfect. Well, listen, Dan, I really do appreciate you coming and spending your time. Uh, it's great to see you again, Thank and you, I wish you the best in 2016. This is David Friedman for Street Savvy Business on Ion Business. You all have a good night.